Sir, this is our second session with uh, Rakesh Aroda, sir. He's an expert in metals and cement sector. So those who are joining for the first time, they can definitely listen to the previous conversation. And uh, sir is a mining engineer from IIT, and uh, he started uh, his first job uh, with the uh, Hindustan Zinc at Udaipur, and there were various roles he had uh, across both the sectors. Uh, in in the past and uh, in the year 2016 sir uh, started go india stocks and everybody is aware the kind of um, data ups provided by sir are above uh, uh, what we define i mean they are pretty last time when we spoke about both these sectors the sector outlook which you shared around may june time it was neutral to negative just about the demand situation the global demand and the china reopening aspect uh, basis uh, the infra and housing sector so i would request you to like uh, again 6 uh, 7 months have passed uh, when we last spoke so would request you like uh, what you uh, view at this let me go on with the questions <clears throat> thank you prince so good evening everyone and thank you for uh, joining this call um meaning at the start of 2024 is back with a hope uh, you know similar to what we saw in 2023 uh, when we were expecting china to really open up after the long you know uh, lock uh, you know lockdown they had because of covid and uh, currently you know there's expectation that china economy which is going through a little bit of a bad patch and chinese government is coming out with you know various stimulus programs to stimulate the economy and that is really driving uh, you know a little bit of rebound in commodity uh, though indian stock market have been on a different plane and indian stocks have been you know kind of uh, going up uh, like there's a bullish uh, you know outlook uh, so now first of all you know we need to understand that um, you know while india is shining and india is uh, the go to market for you know even global investors but when it comes to commodity market it is still china which really calls the shot because uh, china is still 50% of global demand for most commodities Uh, india in comparison would be like 5% uh, at max in for most commodities in terms of global demand and uh, so when you you know think that india is growing at say 10% growth rate uh, that is hardly you know 0.5% uh, change in global demand scenario but if china grows by like 5% or 10% uh, that's around uh, you know 5% extra growth which comes for global uh, in terms of global demand so china really is uh, you know the main driver of commodities uh, now the second factor that we need to understand is that china is coming out of a you know 40 year of a bull cycle in terms of uh, you know uh, consumption for commodities uh, to give you a comparison in 1980s uh, both india and china were at uh, you know around 15 16% urbanization so 15 16% of population was living in urban areas in 1980s uh, india has reached around 30% uh, you know urbanization uh, but china has reached like 65% so there's a massive you know urbanization which has happened in china normally this kind of uh, you know transition from 15% to 65% uh, other countries which developed like you know us uk and you know the other developed countries they took two centuries to do this kind of transition from 15% to say 65% uh, china has done that in 40 years so there's a massive difference uh, in the speed at which china has uh, done urbanization now is it end of urbanization uh, i don't think so because if you look at developed countries Uh, they are uh, you know at around 75 80% urbanization so china's urbanization theme still has some legs so they would be still you know building more cities and uh, moving people to urban areas or modernizing their uh, you know uh, uh, rural areas so that theme will continue but obviously the pace at which they have grown is likely to slow down and that is what is uh, really happening 
uh, the second phenomena which is happening is that uh, you know uh, china has already done a lot of uh, you know basic stuff and now they are moving to the new age thing which is renewable uh, you know and as you would have you know kind of uh, read the news that china has become the largest exporter of uh, ev vehicles also um, i mean uh, byd the company of china has actually overtaken tesla uh, in this year as the largest uh, manufacturing exporter of ev so uh, when talk, people talk about china plus one story uh, but coming to the scale at which china works it is still you know china plus one is china only they are the only one who can really do things at a global scale uh, india is trying its uh, best with pli scheme etc but you know india still can't really go at the same level at which china is so china will remain relevant uh, for the foreseeable future but obviously the uh, one demand growth is going to slow down which is what is happening and number two you know there will be shift from traditional to more uh, you know modern themes like renewables and ev etc that uh, so that is uh, what is really happening now coming to commodities uh, you know there's a big uh, differentiation which is happening so whatever china has in terms of capacity uh, because of the slowdown those capacities are becoming surplus so uh, if you look at what kind of uh, you know commodity capacities china has uh, they have more than a billion ton of steel capacity now their steel production uh, meaning they are shifting from uh, you know blast furnace to electric arc furnaces to become more green steel and now since they have been consuming so much of steel in the last uh, you know four decades uh, scrap scrap generation is improving so they are adding more you know scrap based steel but uh overall the steel consumption is not really growing as much and uh, given the slowdown that we are seeing in china because of their you know property market a uh, lot of this steel is getting exported now and that's why you know you see a lot of pressure on the steel uh, prices globally and even in india on the other hand in china is a importer of raw materials so to make the steel they are importing iron ore in a big way Uh, they are also importing coking coal and both these commodities have been on fire so the last one year meaning while steel margins have been next to zero for chinese steel companies because they have been paying so much for raw material so the second theme which is really coming out is under investment into mining uh, capacities mines get depleted many once you put up a steel plant it is there for like 40 years or something like that but you know the mines which you put up might get depleted in 15 20 years and you need to explore and add more and you know keep on investing and that investment has been you know a little bit uh, weak especially in energy sector because uh, you know the developed countries are expecting a transition to you know renewable uh, and sustainable uh, you know sources of energy and that's why Uh, you see that you know coal prices went up to where it went up last year and coking coal prices have been a surprise package they've been you know at a very a high level of 300 dollar plus uh, similarly i know or also uh, meaning because people were expecting that scrap would st- start to replace iron ore uh, uh, investment into iron ore capacity has also not been that much and in fact you know iron ore because it's a oligopoly structure you have only like three four companies globally who are controlling 70 80% of uh, global trade uh, they have been able to control the supply so at one hand you are seeing bullish trends in uh, you know mining uh, commodities like iron ore coking coal etc uh, on the other hand you are seeing bearish trend in you know manufactured commodities like steel etc so this is a big differentiation which is uh, kind of uh, playing out and uh, so in this kind of environment uh, meaning what do you expect in 2024 so obviously you know chinese government is trying to put some stimulus but uh, will it have a major impact on demand of uh, commodities it looks little bit doubtful to me uh, the property sector is actually you know where chinese uh, populations 
60 to 70 percent of the wealth is in property sector and that has gone down by 15 20 percent uh, at the minimum in last one year secondly you know their stock market is down um, and you would have seen all those charts floating around on twitter uh, that you know there's chinese market has not really given any return for last one decade or something like that so the wealth effect which indians are seeing that is really missing in china and number two uh, you know the unemployment rate in china had jumped up to 18 percent plus and this is you know a number f- uh, from i think july uh, earlier uh, you know last year and uh, after china has actually stopped publishing that data because it's looking extremely bad so unemployment is running extremely high wealth effect is negative so you know a small stimulus measures like you know the monetary policy cutting interest rate and crr and uh, providing people with uh, more you know liquidity of money to uh, take loans i don't think it's going to cut ice as easily and so my belief is that you know while china will do all this it would only mean that they'll remain where they are they may not go down much but is it a bull cycle i don't think so uh, that's going to be a bull cycle so what does it outlay for us uh, in terms of commodity is that uh, they would allow you know chinese companies to produce steel as much as possible they would try to export as much uh, you know steel possible into the global market so i am expecting that steel margins will remain a little bit of subdued uh, because raw metal prices are going up and steel prices are not moving up uh, in the recent uh, you know in india also Indian steel prices were at uh, 10% premium uh, to import parity price. Now they have come to below import parity price. And uh, you would have noticed that NMDC has been increasing INO prices off late in the last two to three months. But steel prices are going the other way around. So for Indian steel companies, you know, there would be margin pressure in Q4. And probably, you know, looking at what's happening till now, maybe it will continue even in Q1 of FI25. Uh, There is some expectation that, you know, government might come and uh, help in terms of restricting the imports. But uh, I don't think it's going to happen before the general elections. I don't think this government uh, is going to favor anyone uh, till the elections are out of the way. So maybe after elections and things are really bad, maybe government might come in. But not for the next, uh, you know, uh, one to two quarters. It doesn't look like that government will come to help in. So you have to be with companies who are fully integrated in terms of their raw materials. So that way, if raw metal prices move up and steel prices follow them, uh, you know, these companies will make better margin. Pure converters have, you know, little chance. Now coming to, you know, so this is about the commodity kind of steel, which is like uh, HRC and uh, which is exported into global market and easily imported. But there are companies which are doing, you know, um, some validated products like, you know, pipes or, uh, you know, wire ropes um, or, you know, railway lines. These are, you know, products which are not easily exported because, uh, you know, when you're making a pipe, it's totally, you know, half is air. So you can't really export that much. And um, most of it is being used in India because of the government push for you know laying uh, providing tap water to every household under the jal uh, jeevan mission and um, so these companies are relatively seeing much better demand and they are doing much better as compared to the larger steel companies which are you know they have huge amount of volume so they can't really be in these they, even if they are doing those pipes or you know evaluated product it's not a big proportion of their total production so smaller companies with these kind of you know domestically oriented valuated product uh, might uh, you know do well they they will see better demand and uh, that could be you know one of the places for where you can look for investment but having said that many market is really smart and they really you know move uh, much ahead of uh, you know what reality happens and most of these uh, stocks are trading at very high valuations so even if there's a little bit of bullishness in domestic focused uh, companies but valuations leave nothing on the table so overall uh, when i look at uh, the metal space 
uh, while there are green shoots uh, from China, there is a possibility that things are bottoming out. But market has moved well ahead of reality. And I really don't see, you know, too much left on the table for the investors. So I'll stop here and, uh, you know, we can take questions if you have any. So, sir, last time when we spoke, uh, you were telling us that uh, the domestic sale premium, which was of the likes of 1500 per ton of steel. So, any any sense around that? Like, is it more or less same or uh, you just mentioned it has decreased? So, what's the position at this point in time? So, at the moment, uh, the domestic uh, PMI actually vanished and uh, Indian steel prices are at a 2 to 3% discount to import parity. And um, so, what this is happening is so there's a lot of built up of inventory in the sales channel. And, uh, uh, you know, producers are not able to clear up. Uh, plus, if you look at, uh, you know, FI25, uh, there's almost uh, 15 million ton of new capacity coming up. So India market is also oversupplied to an extent. So this premium is unlikely to come back in a hurry until unless, you know, government comes up with some measures. It doesn't have to be, you know, import uh, duty only. There could be softer measures also, you know, in past they have resorted to quality checks, etc. Uh, to, you know, restrict uh, but as I said, that given that we are uh, nearing general elections and inflation is going to be one of the factors which government will watch out for, so I don't think they are worried about these steel mills not making money for some time. Uh, they'll wait for elections to get over before they come to the aid. And currently, these guys are doing okay, meaning uh, they are down from the hefty margins they used to make uh, in FI22-23. Uh, they are still reasonably doing okay in terms of margins. And and sir, last time when we spoke, uh, you told that monsoon seasons are basically the lean season. So after like it's almost two quarters when we spoke last. Uh, so I mean that got extended or uh, it's like uh, I mean how we can uh, relate that uh, to that time. So Q3 meaning uh, demand was weak, uh, not just uh, metal but even cement sector. Uh, but, you know, cement sector is a domestic sector and these guys have pricing power. They are not influenced by imports. But uh, steel is, uh, you know, impacted by imports. So they can't really price as differently from the global market. And uh, so there was a slowdown in Q3. It could be attributed to two, three factors. One is obviously, you know, it's a festival season. So labor goes away. Number two, we had, uh, you know, uh, four state elections. So, you know, a lot of decision making and uh, projects get slowed down uh, at that period of time. So I'm hoping that there will be some revival in demand now uh, because, you know, before the general elections, uh, government would try to complete the projects. So I'm hoping there will be some demand, uh, this thing. But currently, uh, you know, inventory in the system remains, uh, you know, much higher. So attempts to increase steel prices uh, are unlikely to, you know, succeed um, in the near term. So I'm expecting that, you know, Indian steel prices will remain at the max near parity. Uh, currently, they are below parity, actually. Although uh, two quarters is too less uh, uh, time for the, the themes of the likes of decarbonization to change meaningfully as you were talking about uh, the especially the non ferrous carbonization is a big issue but uh, i mean some some uh, i mean sense on that like any any improvements or maybe uh, something to add on that sir okay so talking about non ferrous uh, basically you know you have two major commodities which is copper and uh, aluminium um, both these commodities are in little bit of over supply uh, in at least FI25 uh, from what it appears to us uh, because, uh, you know, there is enough supply and we have seen addition to inventory uh, globally uh, in both these commodities. So while longer term looks uh, decent, uh, but, uh, you know, in the near term, uh, there is enough supply available. Now, this demand supply balance is uh, there despite you know, a lot of capacity actually went out of, um, you know, uh, out of action in Europe because of high energy prices. 
now energy prices have actually come down and probably this capacity will come back in fi25 so uh, there would be little bit of more supply coming in whereas demand meaning while we expecting china is already doing very well in terms of renewable which is the main driver of uh, you know these non ferrous commodities so probably that demand will continue but will us so there is a there is likely to be a slow down we expecting uh, even europe there is hardly any revival that we are seeing so demand pick up is not as great whereas supply can come back because energy prices have come down so that's why fy25 doesn't look that exciting even for non ferrous but medium term picture is much better for non ferrous and uh, you know probably if somebody has to choose between uh, non ferrous and ferrous i would say non ferrous is a better place to be in from a medium term perspective but what can you buy in india in terms of non ferrous meaning hindustan copper is a highly expensive stock uh, you know you want to have some copper exposure but you know the valuation at which hindustan copper is trading uh, it's a very you know optimistic bet according to me uh, then in aluminum you do have you know companies uh, like hindalco nalco and um, vedanta uh, nalco has also run up hindalco vedanta reasonably priced i think so there is some opportunity there but as i said uh, don't expect aluminum prices to run up from uh, 2200 odd dollars where they are trading right now uh, in a big way uh, historically aluminum has actually underperformed Uh, quite massively in terms of uh, pricing and um, so i'm expecting a range of uh, between 2100 to 2300 for aluminum for fi25 right sir and and the uh, seeing the mac- macro demand last time you you uh, mentioned about that forecast by world uh, steel dynamics so mm-hmm. uh prince i lost you for a second uh, can you repeat your question okay so i am i am asking like uh, you you told about there is a world steel dynamics uh, which is a six monthly forecast uh, given on the uh, global demand of uh, steel and all so any any meaningful uh, any i mean uh, input uh, in that report or uh, it is yet to publish i mean we spoke uh, i think 7 8 months ago so i was asking i uh, know so you know steel forecast uh, steel demand forecast is you know expected to be around uh, 2% growth globally and um, so india is one of the key drivers uh, china is demand is expected to be flattish to minus 1% and uh, these two countries actually account for 55% of the global demand so the big change is happening here only uh, there is uh, so i would say that you know compared to last year probably there would be slightly better demand for steel uh, in fi25 uh, but uh, you know the chinese export which is the key monetizable number uh, which was around uh, say 90 odd million tons in 2023 uh, in calendar year 2024 i don't think this number will be very far uh, just to give a sense uh, you know at this number was uh, 115 dollar 115 million ton in 2015 then it dropped to closer to around 60 million ton and now it's come back to around 90 95 million ton so there is a increase of around 30 odd million ton of exports from china and that is what is really disturbing the demand supply balance uh, you know so i don't see too much uh, change happening Uh, as compared to what we saw in 2023 uh, maybe a little bit less uh, exports from china but uh, not too much all right sir so uh, vipin ji sake ji as and when you have any question or inputs to make uh, please feel free and so uh, uh, rakesh sir like uh, obviously you talked about the uh, present scenario wherein the price has run up uh, whereas the overall demand and pricing in india seems lukewarm and so i mean in in, in respect of the earnings trajectory for steel and ore companies in next say four quarters so do you think uh, earning of uh, sorry the price has run up far ahead of earnings? things and uh, this is expected to catch up in say next 4 uh, to 6 uh, quarters going forward 
So I think, uh, you know, uh, Q4 and Q1 of FI25 are going to be weak quarters for steel companies. So, you know, I think there'll be a little bit of earnings downgrade. I mean, even after Q3, we have seen some downgrades come through. Uh, but, you know, stocks haven't really corrected as much. And um, I think analysts will cut FI25 numbers only after Q4. So I'm expecting earnings downgrade cycle to continue for uh, next one quarter at least. And uh, so I don't really see too much of an upside. Uh, but Indian market is becoming, uh, you know, kind of overheated and it's difficult to pinpoint at which point it will you know kind of give up but the risk reward ratio is becoming you know highly unfavorable uh, to get into these names now right sir so one of our uh, like uh, audience has sent question in dm so gpil is one of the few companies in india which have long term leases on high quality iron ore mines at old pricing mechanisms and as more and more mines come up for auction under new price regime towards the end of this decade, GPIL's resource moat is likely to get stronger. So is it is this a fair assumption? And do you think this deserve to trade at a premium valuation as compared to the normal ore companies which deserve, say, 5 to 6 or maybe 7x uh, EV or beta? Yeah, so I mean, obviously... Uh... You know, Godavari Power has this uh, massive advantage, and they are also doubling their iron ore capacity. Um, so probably, you know, ninety percent of their profits actually come from iron ore, and if they're doubling that, uh, you can assume that you know their profits are going to be significantly higher uh, once these capacities come on stream in next fifteen to eighteen months. So I think market is cognizant of that. It's a well-flagged uh, story. Uh, does it uh, merit to trade at a much higher uh, valuation? Uh, probably I would say yes, because if you look at the sustainable profitability, uh, you know, on that, uh, they are making a decent uh, ROE. So I would probably think that, uh, you know, um, GPIL can really trade at a higher multiple. Uh, but see, it's, you know, uh, one needs to be cognizant of the risks. Indian government can come and do anything. So like last year, they had come and put 45% export tax on pallet and immediately the profitability can go out of the window. So this is a commodity market. If things get overheated, government can come and act. So those are the factors you need to keep in mind. Also remember that globally, uh, while I know is around $130 right now, the cost uh, of production by these majors is between $20 to $30. And long-term forecast for iron ore is around sixty to seventy dollar by most of the global uh, research houses. So iron ore is trading at a much higher level than the long-term forecast. So investors need to keep in mind that we are currently in a bull cycle in iron ore. Uh, there's a large capacity starting up in uh, Africa, uh, which can really you know uh, put increased supply into the global market. So from a medium term perspective, there are risks also. One need to be cognizant. But having said that, uh, you know, GPIL has a big advantage over uh, the other companies uh, because their, you know, royalty outgo is uh, limited at around 15, 16% as compared to new mine owners who are paying 100% plus. Right, sir. So one quick question before I go to Vipinji and Sakeji. So, so company of the likes of you, which you also, I think, pointed out, uh, small companies uh, which are into maybe processing and selling of steel products. So do you think like uh, these uh, companies and especially uh, without naming a company, if there is a company which has a high client concentration, but again, uh, that is working with that client for over uh, two, three decades uh, period. So... Do you think those uh, companies shall do good at this point in time also? So as I was mentioning that, you know, domestic focused value-added product companies would do well. And um, specifically, as I mentioned, that pipe companies have an advantage because the demand is going to be really strong uh, given government impetus. Government is spending almost $45 billion under Jal Jeevan mission and 40% is yet to be spent. And uh, then there's another, uh, you know, mission in which uh, they want to do, you know, 
the top 400 500 cities uh, and they want to upgrade the water infrastructure so that's another 35 billion dollar worth of demand so pipe companies would have high demand but see do your you know own research on the valuation valuations are really getting stretched uh, for most of these companies fair point sir thank you so saket ji any any inputs you also closely monitor this space or maybe any question to rakesh sir namaskar rakesh ji namaskar saket ji how are you ha bilkul badhiya sir aap kaise hain bas badhiya hai market chal raha hai to acha badhiya hi hai bilkul bilkul ha बिल्कुल आपका मैंने करीब 75-80 परसेंट सुना है आपको बीच में थोड़े देर के लिए मैं चला गया था तो सब आपने सब बढ़िया बातें बताई हैं तो मुझे बस एक बात इसमें ये लग रही है कि अभी जैसे कि डोमेस्टिक प्राइस जो है वो इंटरनेशनल जो पैरिटी है उससे नीचे ही चल रहे हैं तो वैसे तो ठीक बात है कि इलेक्शन के बाद ही कोई नया रूल आना है लेकिन इन केस अगर आ, अभी कुछ हो ही भी तो फर्क क्या पड़ना है जब इंटरनेशनल प्राइस ज्यादा है तो आ, माल तो डोमेस्टिक का ही बिकना है कोई समय तो इंपोर्ट करेगा नहीं सिवाय उनके जो उनका एक रेगुलरिटी चलता है कि उन लोगों को अपना एलसी घुमाना है और उनको तो इंपोर्ट रेगुलर करना ही है नहीं ऑब्वियसली मतलब अगर डोमेस्टिक प्राइस डोमेस्टिक माल अगर अवेलेबल होता है सेम प्राइस पे तो प्रेफरेंस डोमेस्टिक अवेलेबिलिटी को ही दी जाती है बिकॉज uh, एक तो जस्ट इन टाइम आपको मिल जाता है और लीड टाइम उतना नहीं है uh, अभी ऑर्डर किया अगले दिन घर पहुंच जाएगा तो आ, नहीं बिल्कुल वही अंतर है तो ये अभी कैपेसिटी भी तो रिसेंटली बहुत बढ़ गई है ना सर ये जो है इधर टीएमटी में तो रोंगटा माइंस वालों ने बहुत अच्छी कैपेसिटी लगा करके माल बाजार में फेंक दिया है और इधर एन एम में एन और जी भी चालू होने वाला है तो तो सप्लाई तो एकदम से बढ़ गई है जीएसडब्ल्यू का ही फाइव मिलियन टन अभी और एडिशनल कैपेसिटी चालू होने वाला है तो मुझे लगता नहीं कि अब इंटरनेशनल वाले ज्यादा इम्पैक्ट डाल पाएंगे अभी जीएसडब्ल्यू का जब एफ आई ट्वेंटी फाइव जब स्टार्ट किए थे ईयर तब एटी सेवन रुपीज का एपीएस का एस्टिमेट था कंसेंस का अभी काटते काटते पैतालीस रुपए आ गया <laughs> बिल्कुल ठीक बात है सर स्टील में सर आप एक क्वार्टर से ज्यादा तो प्रेडिक कर ही नहीं सकते आपने एक क्वार्टर भी प्रेडिक कर दिया तो बहुत बड़ी बात है पूरा साल तो प्रेडिक्ट करना है पॉसिबल ही नहीं है पूरा साल तो हाँ आप सही कह रहे हैं कि प्रेडिक्ट करना मुश्किल है बट ये चीज जरूर कह सकते हैं कि स्टॉक प्राइस जो बता रहे हैं वो वैसा अभी तो दिखाई नहीं दे रहा है हाँ सर ये तो मैं तो दो महीना से बोल रहा हूँ सबको फिर भी चलो मार्केट अच्छा चल रहा है अच्छी बात है हाँ जी हाँ जी बिल्कुल बिल्कुल सर अच्छा एक आपने आयरन ओर के बारे में बताया कि कोई अफ्रीका में जो नई आयरन और माइंस चालू हो रही हैं और उनकी सप्लाई आने के बाद जो लॉन्ग टर्म फोरकास्ट है उसके वो भी शायद इसी बेसिस पे होगी कि कुछ सप्लाईज नहीं आएंगी तो प्राइजेज नीचे आ भी सकते हैं तो लेकिन जो इंडिया के जितने भी आयरन और वाले हैं सिवाय जो ये जो नए ऑप्शन हुए थे जिनमें कुछ इनका रॉयल्टी का डिफरेंट क्राइटेरिया था जिसकी वजह से जे वगैरह की कॉस्टिंग ज्यादा आती है तो बाकी तो ये सारे माइनर्स जो हैं ये तो एंजॉय कर ही रहे हैं सर कि इनका तो कॉस्ट इतना कम है कि आ, लगता नहीं कि इनको कोई दिक्कत आने वाली है आ, कभी भी नहीं फिलहाल तो गोदावरी हो गया एन हो गया उड़ीसा माइनिंग हो गया या इवन लॉयड मेटल हो गया और सेंदूर भी सेंदूर सारदा हाँ सं, हाँ संदूर है तो इनको कोई ऐसी प्रॉब्लम आने वाली नहीं है केवल मेरा ये कहना था कि क्योंकि एक ये बहुत ही बड़ा डिपॉजिट ये रिपब्लिक ऑफ गिनी में स्टार्ट हो रहा है तो हो सकता है कि उस आ, उसके चक्कर में इंटरनेशनल प्राइजेस नीचे आ जाए अब ऐसा है कि अगर जे कैपेसिटी लगा रहा है यहाँ पे डोलवी में जो महाराष्ट्र के पास है और आयरन ओर को अगर उड़ीसा से लेके आना है तो वो लाने करने का खर्चा इतना है कि अफ्रीका से सस्ते में आ जाएगा तो हो सकता है कि जो वेस्टर्न रीजन में जितने स्टील मिल्स है हमारी <laughs> वो लोग आयन और एक्सपोर्ट कर सकते हैं अगर इंटरनेशनल प्राइजेस नीचे गिरते हैं तो 
हालांकि अपने जो लो रॉयल्टी रेट पे जो है कंपनियां उनको बेनिफिट होगा बट वो बेनिफिट कम हो जाएगा जब ये इंटरनेशनल प्राइजेस गिरते हैं तो तो मैं केवल यही कह रहा था कि थोड़ा सा ये ध्यान में रखने की बात है कि इंटरनेशनल प्राइजेस गिर सकते हैं अभी एकदम पीक पे हैं और उसका प्रेशर इन कंपनीज पे आएगा मतलब अभी की अर्निंग को नॉर्मलाइज अर्निंग मान नहीं सकते आजा वन मोर फॉलो अप क्वेश्चन कि जो ये आपने अफ्रीका वाली माइन बताई ये जो पुराने बड़े आयरन और माइनिंग मेजर्स हैं उन्हीं के कंट्रोल में है या फिर ये कोई अलग कंपनी है रियो टिंटो वगैरह के पास है या नहीं यहाँ पे बेसिकली ये जॉइंट वेंचर है एक चाइनीज कंपनी और गवर्नमेंट ऑफ गिनी का और साथ में रियो टिंटो का भी वहाँ पे कुछ है तो दोनों है मतलब ऑस्ट्रेलियन भी है जो एग्जिस्टिंग है और ये चाइनीज कंपनी ने जॉइंट वेंचर भी किया हुआ है वहाँ पे अच्छा अच्छा तो मतलब वो कार्टल में नहीं है फिर वो कंट्रोल करेंगे नहीं प्राइस अभी वो देखना पड़ेगा और चाइनीज गवर्नमेंट भी बीच बीच में डालती है आयन और को प्राइजेस को नीचे करने के लिए तो अभी लास्ट ईयर क्या हुआ है कि उन चाइना में आयन और प्रोडक्शन काफी कम हो गया था तो चाइनीज इंपोर्ट जो था आयन और का वो बहुत बढ़ गया है एंड उस वो रिवर्स भी हो सकता है और सेकेंडली लॉन्गर टर्म ट्रेंड तो यही है कि सब लोग स्क्रैप की तरफ जाना चाहते हैं जो डेवलप कंट्रीज वाले हैं जैसे कि टाइल अपना ब्लास्ट फर्नस बंद करके यू नो स्क्रैप तो इस तरह से आयन और की डिमांड भी थोड़ी कम होगी आगे जाके और इसका लॉन्ग टर्म प्राइस साठ सत्तर डॉलर होना चाहिए ना कि एक सौ तीस डॉलर जो अभी है ठीक सर ठीक सर ये स्क्रैप तो आज भी जितनी वर्ड में जनरेट हो रही होगी वो कहीं ना कहीं जाकर डिसाइकिल तो हो ही रही होगी वो भले ही डेवलप कंट्रीज अगर नहीं करते हैं यूरोप नहीं करता तो वो टर्की में जा कर के या फिर इंडिया आ कर के रिसाइकिल तो अभी भी हो रही है उसकी हाँ। सप्लाई थोड़ी ना चेंज होगी नहीं सप्लाई बढ़ेगी ना उसमें क्या होता है कि आपने जैसे चाइना ने चालीस साल में इतना डाला स्टील अंदर अब स्टील की लाइफ होती है वो धीरे धीरे निकल के आएगा तो धीरे धीरे स्क्रैप की सप्लाई बढ़ती जाती है जैसे कंपनियां कंट्रीज डेवलप्ड होती जाती है अभी जैसे इंडिया है तो यहाँ पे कोई स्क्रैप सप्लाई नहीं है इतना क्योंकि अपन डाला ही नहीं है अंदर ज्यादा कंस्ट्रक्शन किए नहीं है ज्यादा कुछ किए हाँ, हाँ, इंडिया तो इम्पोर्ट ही करता है है ना तो जहाँ डेवलप कंट्री हो जाती है तो वहाँ स्क्रैप की सप्लाई बढ़ती रहती है तो अब चाइना से उम्मीद है कि वहां पर बढ़ेगी जो 40 साल का जो कंजम्पन है वो धीरे धीरे स्क्रैप में निकल के आएगा बिल्कुल ठीक सर अंडरस्टैंड सर थैंक यू थैंक यू राकेश जी थैंक यू साकेत जी थैंक यू साकेत सो नेक्स्ट क्वेश्चन इज सर लाइक इन इन रिस्पेक्ट ऑफ द स्टेन स्टेनलेस स्टील आर दीज कंपनीज कमोडिटीज और कन्वर्टर कंपनीज एज एबिटा पर टर्न इज स्टिल होल्डिंग अप इन स्पाइट ऑफ चाइनीज डंपिंग any view on bis being enforced here on different series ne dekhiye stainless steel ek alag cheez hai abhi tak apan carbon steel ki baat kar rahe the stainless steel ka market thoda different hai aur apne paas to ek hi company hai stainless steel mein to matlab us company specific dekhna hoga usme generalization karna thoda mushkil hai to स्टेनलेस स्टील की जो कंपनीज हैं उनको उनकी क्या कैरेक्टरिस्टिक्स हैं उसके हिसाब से देखना होगा उसका साइकिल काफी डिफरेंट रहता है कार्बन स्टील से राइट सर यू कैन यू कैन आस्क योर क्वेश्चन देवेश यू आर स्टिल ऑन म्यूट हाय गुड इवनिंग राकेश सर i had a query regarding you were mentioning that uh, there is a scope in mining cap- uh, capacity increasing com- com- looking at companies where mining capacity is increasing the ancillaries of mining so i just wa- uh, want to get a view your view on uh, underground mining companies or the conveyor belting companies that help in mining and mining related activities so uh is there a visibility that india's internal demand will propel growth for these companies as well 
यार इंडिया में उतना अंडरग्राउंड माइनिंग और वैसा होता नहीं है मोस्टली ओपन कास्ट माइनिंग होती है और उसके अंदर जो मशीनरी लगती है, है वो बेसिकली शॉवल डम्पर और कुछ जो छोटे लोग हैं वो केवल टिपर्स भी यूज कर लेते हैं जो टाटा मोटर्स बनाता है या शुक्लिन बनाता है या वॉल्वो बनाता है ये तीन मेन कंपनीज हैं जिनके टिपर्स या वो यूज होते हैं जो लार्ज माइंस हैं जैसे कि कोल इंडिया वगैरह की वहाँ पे डंपर्स यूज होते हैं जहाँ बी एम एक बड़ा सप्लायर है और बाकी अधिकतर मशीनरी शॉवल्स वगैरह जो हैं वो एल एन टी कोमात्सु या इस तरह की जॉइंट वेंचर्स हैं तो आई थिंक माइनिंग खेलने के लिए एक ये दो तीन नाम जो मैंने आपको बताया जो माइनिंग इक्विपमेंट है कन्वेयर बेल्ट वगैरह कुछ एक दो कंपनियां हैं जो और केवल माइनिंग नहीं बट जैसे कि कॉपरेट कैपेक्स साइकिल भी थोड़ी स्टार्ट हुई है तो हो सकता है कि वो यू नो मेटेरियल हैंडलिंग के जो इक्विपमेंट बनाती है कंपनीज उनको फायदा हो बट मैं उसको स्पेसिफिक नाम मैं नहीं बता पाऊंगा और इसके अलावा एक्सप्लोसिव कंपनीज भी हैं जिनको फायदा होता है तो ब्रॉडली यू नो यही एक प्लेयर्स हैं इस सेगमेंट में जिन जिनको आप देख सकते हैं थैंक यू सर सर मैं फॉलो अप क्वेश्चन ऑन दैट एज अंडरग्राउंड माइनिंग इट्स वेरी कॉस्ट इंटेंसिव सो डू यू थिंक कोल इंडिया हैज गिवन एन एम्बिशियस टारगेट दैट टिल टू जीरो टू एट दे विल क्वाड्रपल देयर अंडरग्राउंड माइनिंग आउटपुट सो इज इट पॉसिबल और इट्स जस्ट अ नंबर वी शुड नॉट स्टिक टू इट देखिए टारगेट कोल इंडिया तो एम्बिशियस ही देगा हमेशा पहले उनका बिलियन टन कोयले का टारगेट था 2020 का अभी 2030 है और अभी कल ही मैं बात कर रहा था मेरे एक्स मेरे जो बैचमेट थे माइनिंग इंजीनियरिंग में वो कोल इंडिया में काम कर रहे हैं तीन लोग मिलके देश का 5 परसेंट कोयला निकाल रहे हैं तो बोल रहे हैं कि काफ़ी प्रेशर है गवर्नमेंट से <laughs> तो मुझे लगता है कि कोल इंडिया अभी तो अच्छा कर रहा है वॉल्यूम में और होपफुली अगर ये सरकार रही और प्रेशर रहा बिकॉज ये गवर्नमेंट जो है वो इम्पोर्ट्स कम करना चाहती है और करीबन 200 मिलियन टन का कोयला इम्पोर्ट होता है तो गवर्नमेंट ट्राई कर रही है कि जितना मैक्सिमम निकल आए कोल इंडिया कर ले प्लस आ, काफी माइंस उन्होंने ऑक्शन भी करी है तो कैप्टिव कोल माइंस का भी प्रेशर मतलब वहाँ पे प्रोडक्शन बढ़ाने की कोशिश कर रहे हैं तो मैं कहूँगा कि कोशिश जारी है बट कितना कर पाएंगे वो थोड़ा देखना मुश्किल है आ, अभी तक का कोल इंडिया का परफॉर्मेंस काफी अच्छा रहा है इन लास्ट दो साल में थैंक यू थैंक यू सर फॉर द इनसाइट एंड थैंक यू सर फॉर द अपॉर्चुनिटी थैंक यू Thanks, sir. So last time when we were speaking about the cement sector, you uh, mentioned that on the energy front, coal and petrol and the diesel prices are the two drivers which have to be looked for while uh, looking for the uh, cement sector. So, uh, I mean, uh, as we spoke last time, do you think there is meaningful change in the prices of these, uh, which are the energy requirements, or like? Uh, and also seeing that there are been talk of the town uh, that uh, us uh, might escalate uh, in the iran and all so going forward that these crude prices also may be impacted on that front so any any sense around that for the sector as a whole sir dekhiye uh, aisa hai ki for uh, coal prices have already corrected quite uh, you know strongly so um, thermal coal had gone to more than 300 dollar now it is closer to 100 dollar and that is what is getting reflected in uh, you know uh, margins for cement companies uh, you have seen all cement companies reporting margin expansion of uh, 200 to 250 rupees per ton in q3 and uh, while cement prices are come under a little bit of pressure but uh, i think margin will still expand in q4 uh, because normally q4 volume is 20% higher than q3 and uh, so your cost get differed over a long larger this thing so cement companies margin should expand uh, from here on and now we are already at the fag end of the winter so energy prices uh, you know i don't think there will be a big move up uh, so coal etc i think it's going to remain stable uh, coming to oil meaning despite all the wars <laughs> meaning it it's refusing to go beyond 80 dollar 
and uh, but i think uh, in fy25 uh, with all the production cuts which uh, saudi arabia and opec plus companies have countries have announced um, there would be a little bit of uh, you know shortages coming up in second half of fy25 and that is where i think uh, you know I, oil prices can inch back to 9500 dollar kind of mark so second half of fy25 it is possible first half it doesn't look uh, and all this threat of uh, you know um, us attacking iran etc is not yet reflecting uh, in oil prices so first half of uh, fy25 i'm okay with the oil prices staying closer to 80 85 dollar all right sir and also sir we had a talk uh, on the sustainable sustainability front wherein you mentioned that companies are parking uh, so as to like feeding h2 in the furnaces and even for carbon capturing is one thing which has to be looked out for so uh, are we like meaningfully uh, adhering to these uh, things or like it's it's uh, i mean more of a thing that uh, is immaterial uh, I mean, you know, so companies are making an effort, and uh, they have all given targets of 2047. So I'm hoping I'll retire before that. But yeah, there will be a little bit progress. But I don't think we need to worry about it uh, from a near-term perspective. All right, right. And Ravi also joined. So Ravi, in case you have any questions, so please feel free to uh, ask a question. So uh, for our attendees, also like if. you have any questions please uh, send in a speaker request i'll approve and ask your question to us, sir so let me check the comments and sir i'll come with a question and sir we had a discussion uh, although it was like uh, regarding the caustic soda prices uh-huh. so i mean uh, last time when we were speaking so broadly it appeared that we had a discussion that they appeared to be bottomed out so from there uh, do you see uh, what what changes have taken place in the caustic soda commodity so there's a common uh, you know theme here that china has come back in a full force they were supposed to be vacating the low end of uh, you know commodity which is steel or caustic soda or even you know all those um, chemical sector they have allowed their industry to produce at the maximum because they are trying to support the economy and so that impact is visible not just steel margin but even in chemical sector also and caustic soda is again you know same uh, but i was listening to you know some of the caustic soda companies transcripts and um, they are mentioning that demand is starting to pick up little bit and probably i think um, you know, caustic soda prices have kind of bottomed out from what it appears to me uh, but will it go up in a hurry i don't know but uh, it does appear that things are bottoming out uh, from a chemical uh, you know prices con- uh, perspective uh, there was a lot of destocking which happened so probably there will be a restocking cycle so i would think that in next one to two uh, quarters i think things will start to look up for uh, you know commodities like caustic soda right sir so george is asking sir although you touched upon that but again let me read it out will iron ore prices increase further as nmdc is going to going on increasing its prices uh i don't think so because uh, first of all steel companies uh, so nmdc looks at various things while increasing their uh, price one is obviously the international iron price which has been very strong so that is the reason one uh, that they have been pushing iron prices up number two is the profitability of their uh, you know consumers so um, if jsw is not making money they will not buy iron ore they will stop they will try to reduce and uh, but nmdc is increasing volume also so they need to really clear up the volume so i don't think nmdc would be able to increase uh, you know prices meaningfully from here on uh, until and unless you know um, global prices go up so at the moment i don't think uh, that is happening all right sir although you this question was 
ask last time also it's regarding usha martin so request also to cover views on steel ropes and related sector i think you you covered it right sir uh, i told you know that uh, you know because of the corporate capex cycle and uh, there's a big uh, capex happening in middle east uh, for uh, our, you know oil exploration so these two are the major drivers for uh, you know why rope uh, demand and um, so i see you know healthy demand but as I meaning just you know you need to do your own work on valuations so uh, apart from these two sectors sir which sectors also like at this point in time there is a consensus that opportunities are getting uh, skewed in the sense valuation comfort is not uh, there but again any any other pockets you think that there are some value of it? obviously no names but again broadly any sectors or maybe any sub sectors you find interesting at this point also see um, as i was mentioning that chemical sector is looking bombed out so there would be some opportunities in chemical sector pharma sector and uh, at some point in time even financial sector uh, you know will come back so um, these are the three sectors i actually also infra sector uh, the stocks haven't really moved up much so these could be contrarian uh, you know bets in this market Uh, right sir and the oil and gas companies sir any any i mean thoughts around those companies if you have so see at the moment uh, oil prices are benign and uh, singapore grms are decent uh, plus there's disruption to the supply chain so oil companies are doing reasonably well uh, so i think uh, as i mentioned that i'm expecting oil prices to move up uh, in the second half of fy25 so maybe one to two quarters uh, you are okay holding on to these all right sir and and sir like uh, if we talk about the incremental cash investment so what would be your suggestion on that front or maybe how you are positioning yourself so it's difficult to really you know uh, invest in this kind of a market because if you try to remain on cash uh, you are a big end up performer and secondly if you are value and research driven then again you are going to be an underperform because a lot of stocks which are moving up are you know you won't really be able to fundamentally digest investing in those so see it all depends on overall allocation i think uh, you know one has to follow those rules you can't be 100% in the equity you know at all point of time um uh, there is that thumb rule which is uh, you know 100 minus your age should be equity investment so people should uh, have some debt portfolio also uh, for the rainy day and to be able to invest if market crashes for some reason and normally you know random events can happen so currently you know i would say i would be around 10 15% uh, minimum uh, in debt plus cash so that is my kind of buffer in market correct so i have more money to invest because that is where you make huge amount of return totally agree on that sir so devin bharat doshi he is asking there is high level of interest in solar energy silver is an important element for solar panels any view on silver prices so yeah silver is an undervalued commodity uh, and it has a lot of usage in renewable sector and evs and etc so as an industrial commodity uh, and uh, so to that extent i think um, fundamentally i'm positive on uh, silver uh, but unfortunately there are no plays in india except for uh, hindustan zinc to an extent uh, but the stock is a little bit expensive so, uh, so you know i don't think there is too much you can do to play uh, silver in india except you know in the sun zinc yeah right sir so we got few more speakers so chetan uh, over to you uh punit i'll call your name we go by that order chetan uh, you are on mute uh, you can unmute and ask your question punit i'll come to you yeah yeah hi rajesh good evening 
I, I, I joined in a bit late. So sorry if I'm repeating okay. a question which was answered earlier. Uh, in your knowledge, sir, what uh, this is with respect to the supply or capacity that can come in steel sector. So in your understanding, what is the actual installed capacity today? And what kind of incremental supply will come by, let's say, FY27 or FY28? Because this year, in first nine months, the volume steel consumption has gone up by 12% in volume terms. So I'm just trying to understand what kind of demand supply equation we are looking at two, three years down the line. So if you can help us understand that. So, Jatin, uh, while it doesn't really matter much, uh, India demand and supply, apart from uh, the physical premium uh, that we enjoy here, uh, because as I said, that it still is a global commodity and India is a small player. So I don't think we need to worry too much about, uh, you know, Indian demand supply. But having said that, uh, you know, especially in hot roll coil, mm. there's a 15 million ton of capacity coming up. Mm. And uh, that is where there's a little bit of concern because, um, you know, uh, Indian and there's a bunching up happening because, you know, you have got uh, JSW, you've got Tata Steel and, uh, you know, others also uh, coming in at the same time. And um, so there is a chance that, you know, HRC, which is uh, a global commodity, the premiums can be slightly lower. So overall, see, India has been always been a net exporter of around uh, four five million ton. And uh, this year, they are turning net importer, actually, because uh, China has been pushing so much of material. Uh, but overall, I think we would be largely balanced with around, uh, you know, four or five million ton of net exports. Mm -hmm. And this 15 million tons, all of it will come in 27, 28? Uh, no, no, it's uh, starting from 25, 26. Okay. So, uh, it's not coming exactly in the same quarter, but... Uh, you know, um, so while, you know, this question was asked to JSW Steel also in their recent uh, conference call, and they mentioned uh, that, you know, India is growing at, say, 9 to 10%, and we need around 10, 12 million ton capacity extra every year uh, because we operate at, say, 80%. So, so they were okay with this. Uh, but I think, uh, you know, uh, generally you will see a little bit of slowdown uh, in FI25 in the second half after the elections. Mm. And uh, so there would be some pressure. So FI25, I'm not very hopeful uh, that steel margins uh, would be, you know, high. And with all these capacities coming up at the end of FI25, mm. uh, um, you know, this uh, can get a little bit prolonged. Mm -hmm. And how do you see further capacity expansion programs after, let's say, FI26, 27? Because... At this profitability, I mean, nobody really incentivized to go for big uh, capex plans. Uh, so the imports can just shoot up if that happens. What's your take on that? So, see, uh, basically, uh, you know, the last uh, two years have been very good for the industry. And they have been able to uh, kind of repair the balance sheet in a major way. So the balance sheet stress is not there. And that is the reason, even when we saw all these uh, export duties coming in and margins crashing, the stocks didn't really go down to the level which normally we have seen historically. So companies are in a much better uh, balance sheet uh, position. And now, uh, earlier you had only JSW actually trying to grow. But now Tata Steel has uh, kind of sorted its Europe and is focusing in India. Um, mostly, you know, organic growth they want to do. Uh, Jindal Steel and Power has also kind of sorted the balance sheet. They are actually very little debt on their balance sheet. Then, you know, you have this government which is egging even the PSUs now. So, and then let's not forget Aslam Mittal. Uh, they also want to have the, you know, um, share of pie here. So, the, you have multiple uh, you know, companies who are looking to grow and gain market share. So I don't think they are going to be deterred by, you know, small dip in profitability. Mm -hmm. Their balance sheets are okay. They will continue to expand. Um, yeah, I don't think they are stopping in any way. Mm -hmm. Got it. Got it. Thank you, sir. That, that was it from my end.
Thank you, Jatin. Thanks, Jatin. Uh, so, Puneet, uh, you can unmute and ask your question, please. Uh, sorry for earlier. Uh, good evening, Rakesh ji. Uh, I wanted to know your outlook on uh, aluminium sector, uh, aluminium companies, mining companies, and uh, processing companies in the medium term. Uh, I joined in later. Sorry if, if I'm repeating. Uh, no problem, Puneet. Uh, so basically, J aluminium, I was saying, is that medium term it looks good uh, because of the renewable demand. But uh, in the near term, I don't think, uh, you know, the market is very well balanced and there's a little bit of increase in inventory. And there is some supply which can come back in Europe because they it was shut because of high energy prices. And now energy prices have kind of leveled off, um, you know, gas prices have come down quite a bit. So, you know, there could be a little bit of supply coming back. So I'm expecting, you know, uh, aluminum to trade in the range of $2,100 to $2,300 uh, for this year. Uh, maybe, you know, in, you know, as demand picks up in the developed world again, uh, probably FI, end of FI25, we might see some increases in aluminum. But uh, it's a well-supplied uh, commodity, I would say. So you think the current margins are sustainable, right? Right, yeah, meaning uh, you uh, check out, uh, you know, what Vedanta is reporting, uh, you know, their cost of production has dropped from $2,600 to $1,700 now in the last quarter, Q3. And uh, current prices are around $2,200 plus you add uh, $150 of physical premium. Uh, you are making $600, $700 on, uh, you know, uh, that's a healthy margin uh, which the companies are making. And uh, so I don't think, uh, you know, um, anybody is deterred to not produce. And that's why I said that it is a reasonably well-supplied market. So just just a uh, uh, question on Vedanta. So you think the uh, drop in uh, cost of production is one off or it, it is a sustainable uh, basis? It is done on sustainable basis. So... I mean, it is driven by the energy costs coming down, uh, but they are making a lot of effort. So they are going uh, fully captive on bauxite. Uh, they are adding, uh, you know, captive alumina capacity. So I think, uh, you know, they will be able to sustain at this uh, $1,700. Uh, they, I think their guidance is around $1,800, $1,900 on the medium term. So if energy prices remain where they are, I think they will do better than that. So, so they have a, a bauxite mine coming up in 2025. That that is also on track, right? I I, I am not tracking the con call recently. Just uh -huh. ask. That is what they have said in the con call, and normally their execution is okay. Uh, meaning they do you know good execution. So I am hoping that they will be on track. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thanks, Kunit, uh, Devesh, and then data chart. Yeah. Uh, sir, just a question regarding this uh, tanker rates and uh, the Red Sea issue going forward. Do you see it uh, higher, uh, tanker rates staying higher for longer, or this is just a short term blip and this would uh, uh, revert back to me? See, very difficult to say. Um, I don't think it's a short term thing. Because uh, having read about uh, these uh, Yemen uh, rebels who are doing this, um, I don't think it's just about Ukraine. Uh, it's not just about, uh, you know, uh, Israel and Palestine. I think uh, they have found that the world is starting to notice them. Uh, they'll continue to do this. But uh, I, it's very difficult for anyone to say how long will it last and, you know, what the U.S. will do and all that. So... Um, in the near term, I think uh, tanker, uh, not tanker rate, but container freight is likely to remain up. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Thanks David. Thank you. So next is data chart and then Suresh. Yeah, sure, uh, thank you for having me. Um, I had a couple of comments that you were stating. So the Drury uh, World Container Index, that's even 5% higher. Uh, the new number comes out on Thursday. So that's been elevated. The only three routes that have gone down year over year, right, 
are LA to Shanghai, New York to Rotterdam, Rotterdam to New York. All the other um, all the other routes are up elevated. There's even some that are up over 188%. Question back to Indian markets. Uh, small and mid caps did very well last year. I shared some things up top, but um, anyways, the, the flows have started to go into mid caps again. Do you see continued performance because India is one of the bright spots, even market wise? The rupee last month, right, uh, was one of the better performing currencies in uh, Asia Pacific. Do you see rupee still hovering around 83? First question. And then performance wise, do you still see a continuation? across you know uh, mid caps small caps or do you think large caps will also join into the rally for the remainder of the year uh, so let's see in terms of rupee uh, uh, it's driven by the current account deficit and till the time oil prices are benign i don't think uh, you know current account deficit is going out of the way uh, so i would expect rupee to be range bound around 83 um, and uh, Coming to Indian market performance, obviously it has been a stellar performance and we are hoping it will continue. At the moment, I don't see anything which is going to derail it um, because, uh, you know, retail participation in market is starting to improve. It is still at a very nascent stage. It's only like I think um, investment into equities would be less than 6-7% of, uh, you know, um, financial assets that the people have. So this trend is only going to get stronger and stronger. And that is actually uh, kind of uh, reducing the volatility which normally FI flows had on the markets. So at the moment, I don't really see any reason why this trend should change. Uh, but obviously, as I said, valuations are looking a little bit uh, peakish. Yeah, just to add to what you're stating, yeah, foreign investors actually own more than domestic investors, right, in, in the Indian market right now. So, um, and last question, you were saying uh, diversification-wise, right, cash or, you know, fixed income, if you want to call it, um, do you see equity still being in favor for the remainder of the year? And that's just a broad, broad question. So yesterday, um, one of my mates called me, but yeah, what should I buy? In which stock should I buy? So now that is the level where we are reaching that even maids are calling to participate in the stock market. Obviously, I told her that, you know, do an SIP in mutual funds. <laughs> but um, to answer your question, uh, I think this phenomena is, uh, you know, gaining up. FI is on around 21-22% in Indian market. And um, they would be, you know, churning a little bit here and there. Uh, China is coming back to flavor a little bit because of the government action there. Uh, I think uh, there's a long uh, tailwind to retail participation into markets. And uh, that uh, means that there might be hiccups, but I think the trend is, uh, you know, towards that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So Suresh, uh, you can unmute and ask your question. So Suresh, you are still on mute. Uh, you can unmute and ask your question. Sir. Good evening, sir. Good evening. Yeah, please go ahead. Sir, what about the NBFC, sir? Gold loan. NBFCs. NBFC is, uh, see, um, banks are under pressure. Um, I think the rates at which they lend to NBFC is going to go up. Uh, we have to see whether they will be able to pass on or there will be margin compression. So, uh, earnings growth wise, it's not looking that, uh, you know. Uh, rosy for NBFCs uh, for the next few months. So I think uh, it will be banks which will recover first and uh, maybe then NBFCs.
Uh, so, like, although credit cycle is linked to all the sectors, because until unless uh, the credit cycle is in uptick and strong, so there are high chances that uh, all the sectors won't do good. But again, uh, broadly, like uh, how and uh, wherein uh, within the cycle you see we we are at this point in time in the credit cycle and uh, how things can progress from here. The problem is the credit cycle is growing much faster. Than the deposit cycle, and that is where RBI is putting pressure, and that is where HDFC Bank has come under a you know little bit of strain. Uh, that uh, uh, deposit to credit ratio, uh, sorry, rather credit to deposit ratio is getting skewed. Uh, it has to be around less than eighty percent. Uh, HDFC Bank is around one hundred and ten, and industry wide, uh, we are touching more like eighty percent. So until unless deposit uh, growth picks up, uh, credit growth will have to come down. And uh, RBI has a difficult, uh, you know, thing here because one, they were trying to control inflation, and they have reduced uh, the money supply uh, in the country. Uh, can they risk increasing the money supply now and inflation comes back uh, pre-election? Looks difficult to me. So I think uh, the only solution is that uh, Indian economy slows down. Uh, to compensate uh, for this, so we are looking at a slightly slower growth in FI25. All right, so so one question from N Kumar is Lloyd's Metal is talking about BHQ iron ore uh, benefication, approximately forty five million tons iron ore or fifteen tons of sixty five F uh, FE iron ore. Why it was not attempted in India so far, while China has been doing it quite for some time? Any any comments around that? So see now it makes sense because you have so much of royalty coming in, and there's a protection. When you know things are easy, you don't really attempt hard things. Only when it's getting difficult, and there's margin to be made, do you attempt all these kind of things. So it is just a part of natural evolution, and uh, India is reaching to that stage now. All right, sir. And Amit Jaiswal has question around the LPG and CNG space. So he's asking uh, anything about LPG and CNG and its future expansion in India energy mix. So see, government has a stated uh, objective of reaching sixteen percent. Uh, you know, of energy basket as uh, gas uh, from the current around, I think, six seven percent. So direction is very clear. Uh, there was hiccups in last uh, you know year or two before because of uh, the Ukraine war. Uh, gas prices had jumped materially, but now they are back to normal levels, and I think uh, India's uh, growth of um, both LPG and CNG is going to be very strong. So I'm pretty bullish on uh, you know uh, this uh, gas companies who are dealing with this sector. All right. So thanks. So more or less all the question in the comments I have read it out to you, sir. And so one last call for our attendees. Any quick question, please feel free. And also those who are already uh, uh, as a speaker, if they have any question, otherwise we'll conclude for the day. So, sir, anything more uh, which you had in your mind, or maybe uh, we we couldn't ask through our questions? I think we have largely covered uh, most of it, and uh, I'm obviously available on Twitter anytime. So, any questions you can post there also. Uh, right, we we got a hand raise, and Brijesh also joined. So, Brijesh, you go first, and then we go to data chat. Yeah. Yeah. Good evening, Rakesh sir. It's always a pleasure to listen to you. Know your views on the metal and sorry, I'm bullish. I have given you a bearish view, de diya thoda, but <laughs> no, no, no. Actually, the, we are passing through a very secular bull market, so there is no skill left in searching any stock. Each and every stock has gone up. So, Correct, correct. Just uh, I want to know you about uh, this. Uh, just I checked the U.S. markets. The Dow Jones Iron Steel Index uh, has caused another new 52-week high there. 
So is there any correlation? Yeah. As you explained very well, because I also got the same feeling from the, my uh, the trader my community that uh, mm-hmm. the Raipur people are asking NMDC to reduce rates and they are not uh, taking the deliveries for iron ore for, on these high rates. Your views are perfect. Mm-hmm. The point is you know, the bullish or bearish. Is there any, uh, so, yeah. any for this uh, US uh, making new highs and can we see a ready in Indian market also? So US is a protected market and uh, so it has its, you know, kind of a different uh, path on its own. Uh, normally the prices are 100 to 200 dollar higher for steel in US as compared to rest of the market. Uh, secondly, you, uh, I think you had tweeted about it, uh, about the possible uh, consolidation in U.S. steel industry. Um, there was a bid made in U.S. about uh, the top two companies in the country kind of consolidating. So that is also one of the, you know, hope factors. And uh, so apart from that, uh, you know, uh, there has been a lot of uh, pickup in manufacturing first. Uh, capex in us also uh, because they were trying to bring a lot of uh, you know manufacturing in house uh, after the tussle with china so meaning there the capacity increases are not happening the same way as what is happening in india in steel so they are the demand supply balance in us is slightly better and if they are able to control imports through you know protective measures which they did um, US steel companies can, you know, uh, continue to enjoy a little bit higher profitability. And that is what is getting reflected. Uh, but overall, when you look at uh, multiples, it's not very far from India. Uh, it's kind of similar, uh, despite the run-up. So they, they were doing a little bit of catch-up. Indian companies didn't go down as much. Uh, so that's why there was no valuation uh, comfort um, uh, that we could get in this downturn. So, I hope I try to answer your question. Yeah, I got it. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Pradesh. So, uh, data chart you had in your hand raised, you can quickly ask and there is one more question in DM. So, last two questions. Yeah, data chart, please go ahead. Yeah, no worries. Um, just to add to what you're talking about with U.S. steel production, so they do have 120% tariff right on Chinese steel. Obviously, China is the lion's share of steel production in the world. Uh, you've had the partnership right with Nippon and with Metal. So Nippon is the other bidder for uh, United Steel right in in the U.S. Even Cleveland Cliffs, uh, which just reported their earnings, um, they're the other bidder, but Nippon's come in with a with a better bid, right? But that requires approval from the U.S. authorities on that. Um, Cellcor Metal, right? As, as you had mentioned earlier, with steel production, obviously multinational conglomerate. Uh, Tata, right? That you'd mentioned earlier as well, just to help answer the person uh, in your comments. Um, they're shutting down their blast furnaces, right? So they're going to to Arc, uh, the Arc system. So they had planned for the capital expenditure there. Um, now, this is the big question here. Now, AI, right? With artificial intelligence, China's invested heavily. Of course, the U.S., as you've seen, whether it be through their chips and that. Do you see India spending on AI? Question number one. And then two, when it comes to supply chains, do you see efficiencies? And this is more long term, right? So there, there's no wrong or right answer. But do you see that slowly making its way? into industrial production obviously education is also transforming but do you see this being a driver uh into the indian economy as well as into the capital markets so uh, good question i would say Uh, but i don't think indian companies uh, you know have the wherewithal Uh, i mean obviously large uh, corporate groups like tata's they have you know uh, capabilities in their sister concerns, but to expect uh, you know um, steel companies to benefit from AI immediately, I think it's a little bit far away. Uh, 
uh, we are starting to see a little bit of uh, you know ai usage come in uh, but it's more recreational at the moment i would say rather than you know um, actual uh, usage in the industry and especially in manufacturing uh, i think uh, we are still some time away but obviously it's a big big revolution and um, it is bound to find its way into the industrial sector also but i think we are a few years away from that so satish you can unmute and ask your question please oh hi hi everybody uh, uh firstly thanks for the uh, thanks for all the insights uh, on this space so sir one uh, one question from me is uh I wanted to know if the renewables and the solar sector stocks have already run up enough in the last one year, all the you know mid caps and small caps, or do we still have a long way to go considering India's stand on renewable energy, Paris Accord, and uh, recently our Prime Minister uh, announcing the uh, rooftop solar scheme that uh, uh, you know that India wants to take to take up. So uh, I see a lot of. Uh, Uh, you know uh, positive tailwinds but then i also wanted to know has the you know has our companies run up enough in the market uh, or it is just that you know uh, or we we it is just that the valuation correction happens and uh, the market will just uh, improve offline so satish obviously you know you have uh, rightly pointed out that there's a huge tailwind to this sector and we are just scratching the surface at the moment we have a long way to go uh, so probably companies I many obviously market gets overboard and uh, what one can do is uh, look for corrections to enter these stocks so i don't think uh, you know uh, the growth opportunity I many it's going to peak out only probably by i think at 2050 or 2670 so we have a long runway of growth and uh, so getting into right companies on correction could be one of the strategies thanks thanks sir uh, so especially i think i i see kpi group of uh, stocks leading the charge but again i uh, when I'll, when we look at the pe's and the valuations uh, uh, we really don't really know how, you know how to look at them uh, many so difficult investing <laughs> in these uh, high growth uh, companies yeah so um, meaning that's where the allocation actually comes in how much percentage you want to allocate for what and what is your style of investing so i mean i probably is more value driven uh, mm-hmm. maybe i may not really touch those high pe stocks yeah. uh, but uh, but it depends on your style so whatever you are comfortable with um but the sector has lot of tailwinds and uh, you know the growth is going to be there so one can look for opportunities during uh, you know volatility and corrections sure thanks sir thank you so jivesh has one question sir he is asking uh, do you think petronet lng is finally break out, breaking out after consolidating for many years mm, see as we mentioned that uh, you know gas prices have come off and india is focused on uh, you know increasing the share of lng in its energy basket and the petrol energy is obviously one of the major players uh, in this space so their growth rate are going to be decent the stock has run up uh, but valuations are not obscene i would say uh, so probably one can keep an eye on that thank you sir uh, all the questions are well taken and you answered them uh, well in your capacity and that was really helpful for our audience so those who join late can surely listen to the recording at a later point in time thank you so much for uh, joining us again and sir it's always great to hear you for, uh, thank, you, thank you for organizing this and thank you everyone for you know listening to us and staying along for so long so thank you and good night to everyone good night sir and as i was saying so if anybody has uh, unanswered questions so they can directly write on twitter or maybe dm to sir so sir will be happy to take uh, relevant questions and the conversation which happened and if you joined late can surely be listened at uh, the youtube channel that goes by the name of accidental investor prince i'll be uploading in a day or two thank you so much and good night take care